Hello and welcome to our webinar today uh, on a very interesting corporate law topic that is uh, an impact we suggest for a number of uh, companies, uh, in particular local authority companies. And um, this is a case that actually has just been um, ruled in the High Court um, that concerns the model articles um, and that which are the, the articles that are effectively produced as the standard form articles for companies that are incorporated. Um, just by way of an introduction, uh, my name is Peter Collins. I'm the head of corporate at Sharp Pritchard. Um, I specialise in um, corporate law, um, and in particular setting up local authority companies and other delivery structures as well within the public sector. I'd like to hand over now uh, to uh, my colleague, um, Sophie Pilcher. Hello, um, my name is Sophie Pilcher. I am a newly qualified solicitor and I've just qualified into the team with Peter. Um, I I'm also helping out and setting up local authority companies um, and looking at things like the model articles and how those local authority companies can be incorporated. So it's very relevant to this case. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sophie. And it's, it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, I mean, think one of the things that we'd like to get across in this webinar is really just what is what is a very surprising judgment in this uh, in this particular case. And we'll go through the facts of the case and we'll go through the, the, uh, the sort of ramifications of it <clears throat> later in the webinar. But I think I think what, what is the um, the purpose really is to, is to try and draw out some of those impacts of the of the judgment um, on a wide range of companies uh, and the way that their constitutions in particular have been drafted. Um, and I think it's 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 unclear exactly yet what the what the results are going to be of, the, of this judgment and it may end up that the government takes some action in terms of changing the model articles on the back of it um, but what we what we thought it would be useful to discuss today was to try and tr try and sort of develop what the judge has effectively ruled upon uh, and see how what those implications are for for companies private companies and in particular in particular we feel as though are relevant for local authority companies as well um, so what we thought we would do, I think, Sophie, you're going to give a little bit of a um, brief details of, of, of the case, aren't you now, and take it and just a little bit of the context. Yeah, so this case is called Hashimi versus uh, Lorimer Wing, um, sometimes referred to as Re for Fitness Investment Holdings Limited. Um, and as Peter has already said, this was a case considered by the High Court. Um, and it concerned in particular whether a company had validly served a notice of a counterclaim against a shareholder. And it's uh, the, the this particular case brought into question whether that counterclaim had been validly served. Yes, the shareholder put an application to say that it, it wasn't validly served, which was successful in this case, which is what makes it so interesting. Um, the judge had highlighted that the counterclaim was actually issued ultra virus, so done outside the, the company's proper authority, um, as the articles had not been complied with in the way that they were currently drafted. And I think I think one of the the important um, sort of elements that we need to to sort of cover in the context of this is really just a bit of a recap, isn't it, on what the model model articles are, um, you know, why they exist and, and what their purpose is. And Sophie, could you give us a little bit of background around the purpose and the the reason that the model articles exist in the first place? Absolutely. Um, so the model articles are there as a legal document in a kind of standard format so it's easy for companies to incorporate um, and the model articles are there to regulate how a company is run so they form part of what we call a company's constitution and they essentially regulate how a company operates on a day-to-day -day basis um, how shareholders is, uh, potentially are supposed to operate and how the directors of the company run the business on a day-to-day -day basis and I think it's uh, it's worth pointing out as well, isn't it, that the, the you know the model articles are effectively the you know the, the template um, example version, effectively that was produced by the government when the you know the Companies Act 2006 was was brought in. Uh, and really, the message at that time was was that you know this this is a standard form of articles that can be used and will be sort of automatically issued uh, on incorporation unless. You, you you provide us with a version which are bespoke uh, and they can be amended these articles can't they say but you, you can pretty yeah. much do what you want with them 
Yeah, um, yeah. As you've uh, as you've just said, you can do exactly what you like with them. Um, you can take them as they are. You can amend certain articles. You can scrap the whole thing and come up with your own if you like. As long as you are, as long as that is clear on incorporation, what what the company has chosen to do, um, you can really do whatever you like. Yeah, um, within, and within, this, within that kind of within that sort of framework, isn't it? That's kind of like provided by the Companies Act 2006. Yeah. So providing it doesn't contradict anything, effectively you you have that free reign, don't you? And I think that's what makes this case really interesting to me is, is the fact that so many companies assume um, that actually just by taking the model articles, that that's enough. That uh, they're safe. It, yeah. it, it's done, you know, we've got a, we've got a standard, you know, constitution here that will work. And I think what this case sort of suggests is that actually that's a fairly simplistic um, uh, viewpoint now. And I don't think you can say with any form of guarantee that the model articles taken without any form of amendment at all are going to be satisfactory. Um, and I think it's also probably worth um, looking at a little bit at this point, just in terms of what, the, you know, how legally the, the, the articles of association of a company are are seen and are viewed uh, and interpreted really because they are um, whilst they're sort of seen as the constitution they create a they create what is effectively a, a sort of a, a, a series of covenants between the the shareholders and the company um, and they're effectively to be construed and to be interpreted um, with the ordinary principles that apply for any sort of written contract um, and I think that's the one thing that is sometimes overlooked as well is that they're seen as this sort of separate statement almost of principles, but they are and they do have this binding effect on shareholders um, and the company itself. And, and that really forms um, the basis of, of, of the contractual relationship, which is why you often see um, as well, of course, um, these articles supplemented by, by shareholders agreement. But that's probably for a different day and possibly a different webinar. But I think what, <laughs> what what the what I think the areas of the model articles of this case really look to concentrate on was around the decision making by directors, and in particular, decision making by directors in the context of um, the distinction between a sole director making decisions um, and and a, a, a sort of a quorum. And a board in a meeting scenario taking decisions. And I think possibly it's worth, Sophie, if you could sort of describe for us those principles around um, the model article seven and, and model article 11. So here, um, this is sometimes referred to by corporate lawyers as um, the general rule. So there's kind of a standard industry, if you like, interpretation here. So with regard to um, model article 7 that's talking about or 72 in particular that's talking about uh, a, a sole director so when you go down to the one director and as you've said peter model article um, 11 is talking about quorum for a meeting and 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 how that's been interpreted so far is the sole director, according to Article 7.2, is basically allowed to take all decisions if you get to a point where you have the one director. If you have more than one director, that 7.2 is kind of believed to be disapplied, if you like. And then you look at Article um, 11, which is talking about what you would do in a meeting. So, um, it talks about having a quorum of two, which means that you would be able to make or a company would be able to take decisions if they had at least two directors present at a meeting. Um, so basically, if you get down to a, a situation where there is one uh, director, essentially Article 11.2 is almost disapplied and that's how the kind of general rule works. Um, this case has obviously come along and essentially blown this industry standard out the water, if you like. Um, it's potentially saying that that, that is not correct. So uh, while obviously there are provisions in the Companies Act that say you can have a sole director, um, 
companies have now got to be careful on the back of this case that Article 7.2 and in particular 11.2 actually work together and are more harmonious perhaps than the government version of the model articles as currently drafted. I think that's that's just that's a really kind of sort of important distinction. I think this is what makes the 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 sort of the ramifications of this case so um, possibly wide ranging is the fact that you know this these the, the general rule that uh, that allows a sole director to to continue to make decisions uh, seemingly without due concern for the um, the drafting that's contained within Article Eleven um, has been sort of broadly accepted as being a, a, an entirely valid way for sole directors to run their companies. And it's probably worth pointing out that there are tens of thousands, I would suggest, yeah. of these types of companies out there who, who potentially are, are, are risking prior, prior decisions in some circumstances, having been made ultra virus yeah. um, and therefore voided. Um, so there, there, are, there is a there's a real issue here that needs to be explored. And I think it, it's um, it, it's one that this case has really brought to the fore. Um, and I think it's probably worth um, you know, looking at the implications as well, and we'll do this in more detail later in the webinar, but for the for, for, for the public sector and for local authority companies, you might think, well, they're quite rare having a sole directorship for a local authority company, but often they are set up initially with sole directors. Yeah. Um, and quite often as well, um, they 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 end with sole directors as, as, you know, local authorities that have not had a successful experience with a um, with a local authority company may end up for it, it you know resting dormant somewhere with one director in there who's been making decisions with with articles that potentially are not appropriate and that gives rise to to concerns uh, it, Sophie, it's probably worth us um we've talked about some of the background and and some of the principles to to the case it, or to the to the context of the case it, it might be worth us just uh, reflecting briefly on on the on the facts because they i mean it's one of these situations where actually the, the principle that's sort of kicked out of the judgment um, uh, is much bigger in a way and sort of much more, uh, you know, uh, the implications are more than the, the, what seem like fairly sort of standard facts. So maybe you could just uh, at least put it in, into context in terms of the, the facts of the case. Yeah, so this case um, actually concerned uh, the falling out of um, two that, well, what were two directors? So um, we'll, we'll call them H and, and LW for the purposes of uh, brevity. Um, <laughs> so uh, H was a shareholder of, of the company um, that became a director, and LW incorporated the company, and further on down the line, for various reasons, became. A, 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 its sole director. Um, so prior to LW becoming the sole director, as I said, H was a director, um, and a disagreement arose between H and LW, which resulted in uh, LW essentially kicking H out as a director, um, which was uh, allowed under the model articles, and he was deemed um, a, a bad lever under the terms of the model articles, which is not not a position that I dare say H wanted to be in. Um, as part of those bad lever provisions, basically he had, as I said, he was a shareholder and he was told um, that that he had to transfer his shares back to the company in, in very basic terms. Um, H obviously was very unhappy about this and filed an unfair petition, um, an unfair prejudice petition under Section 994 of the Companies Act. Um, LW obviously had again was was not happy about the fact that this unfair petition had been filed and served a defence and counterclaim of his own on behalf of the company against H, um, claiming various things such as breach of director's duties when H was um, in office, if you like, um, breach of contract and various other things. Um, and the question really of this entire case revolves around the validity of the company's ability to serve that defence and counterclaim. Um, so LW obviously at this time being the sole director, so LW and the company are one and the same in this case. And the High Court having examined the, um, the model articles, and we should at this point say that they were slightly varied in this case, so they had a bespoke Article 16 which essentially said that 
two directors were needed, two specific types of directors were needed for to form a quorum. So that obviously then informs Article 11.2. And um, the High Court found that, as we've discussed, the counterclaim was issued ultra virus, so done outside the company's proper authority, um, as the company's articles, the model articles with this slight variation, um, had not been complied with. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. And I think I think this this sort of raises a whole host of, of, of questions. I think I think you know the judgment here, in my view, will come as a a surprise uh, to to corporate lawyers. Um, certainly in our jurisdiction, because it is it has long been the working assumption that Article uh, Seven Two that gives the ability of a sole director to to run the company in the absence of um, well in the absence of any other directors, um, and, and effectively has the impact of misapplying the requirement for a quorum of two directors. So that stands to reason, and that those two articles have never really rubbed along particularly well together. The corporate lawyers have broadly arrived at a view that they they can work together and amended and that 7-2 will uh, effectively trump um, 11 yeah. uh, in a sense and, and will allow a sole director to operate and make decisions on behalf of a company, notwithstanding that 11-2 exists requiring a quorum of two directors. Um, <clears throat> this, this judgment throws that logic and that assumption totally on its head. Yeah. Uh, and actually, the implications of this are that there could be uh, companies uh, up and down the country that have been making ultra-virus decisions for a long time, particularly those um, which have a sole director um, or have gone down to having a sole director from having numerous directors. And I think in many ways, those companies are the ones that are more at risk Yeah. because yeah. they may not send that in going down from several directors to a sole director, they may not have considered changing their articles uh, to account for this new situation and thought, well, we've got the model articles, we'll be fine because of Article 7.2. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think there's, there's some real issues there uh, that, that need to be addressed for those companies. And I think the other really surprising thing for me is that it seems to me that, that the judgment seems to fly in the face of the of the government guidance at the time that was issued with the model yeah. articles, which did suggest actually that the, the two articles were uh, independent of one another uh, in, in in that sense, but you could you would not need to um, make specific changes to the model articles for a company that had a sole director. So I think, um, I think it was Bayes guidance that was issued at the time um, the model article regulations were brought into mm -hmm. force um, as there was some debate about this at the time um, and the Bayes guidance uh, as you've quite rightly said, Peter, um, suggested that the model Article 7.2, again, this is where the general rule has, has come from, I believe. Um, the model Article 7.2 is essentially um, not relevant if you have more than one director. Um, mm, absolutely. So, I mean, it, it, it sort of raises a number of questions, and I think, you know, for local authority companies and for other uh, companies in the public sector, um, there's definitely going to be a need to, to look at this and to look at the constitution of, of, of the local authority company. Um, there are local authorities, of course, which have numerous uh, and group structures, some of which are, you know, constituted in a way that this will not give rise to any difficulties whatsoever because they, they've got the model articles as amended or they've got entirely bespoke articles that, that, that deal with the situation uh, yeah. effectively. Um, but there will also be ones out there that don't, uh, and and you know the uh, local authority companies, um, <clears throat> you know that they are an extremely useful um, delivery structure, but you know the reputation of local authority companies is varied. You know is variable at the moment. I think you know getting to a situation potentially where decisions made by them could be in certain circumstances be ultra virus may give rise to some concerns. Um, so what I think, you know, what we would all what we'd recommend in, in light of this uh, decision uh, is is essentially to review what the the constitutions are um, of both private companies that are operating commercially, uh, but also companies within the public sector as well. Uh, and because this will apply 
uh, across across the board um, and ensuring compliance is going to be key here. I think what you don't want to do is again a situation where prior decisions <clears throat> are called into question and it could be particularly in relation as we've seen in this case of disgruntled um, uh, ex shareholders and ex directors who have got an axe to grind who may look very closely at the decisions that were made at the time um, to see whether actually this the judgment in this case gives potentially a, a, a cause of action for them as well. It, um, it could it could even be an issue for local authorities where um, they potentially want to wind up a company and in so thinking about that process have reduced the directors down to one. Um, then you could be in a situation where you know you have a winding up and and that has been um, incorrectly done essentially. Yeah absolutely that's a really good point isn't it and I think particularly given that you know that decision to um, that you know if you're striking off the company obviously there has to be certain directors decisions that have to be made <clears throat> to do that um, uh, and in so doing if that hasn't been made validly um, there could be some some implications of that. What we'd always look to do is to um, audit them and look at those and see if they're still effective. But also where there are issues, look to have some kind of uh, ratification process to see if there's a way in which we can go back and actually get the shareholder of the company to ratify any past decisions. And that will have the effect of uh, reducing the risk of this case, uh, the implications of this case causing liability for more issues um, for the companies involved. Um, um, so I think I that, think, sorry, so if you go. I was just going to say, I think we also, although Articles um, 7 and 11 are obviously considered by this case, I think it's also worth noting that, that Article 8, um, which talks about written resolutions, there is a potential need for redrafting in that case. If redrafting is the decision that, that the company decides to do. You have to essentially make sure all the lawyer redrafting the articles will really have to make sure that, that all the articles fit together as a cohesive whole now. Um, I think before there was just, like we say, there was just this accepted general rule where you uh, incorporated a company under the model articles and you were good. Um, I think now a, a lot more Care, care and attention is going to be ha is going to have to be taken over that approach. Um, article eight essentially mirrors the core and provisions of Article eleven, so you're really going to have to make sure, like I say, that everything fits together as a cohesive whole. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. I think that's a really important point. Um, <clears throat> it's always been slightly unusual with the model articles, the way that those those fit together. And I think this is a perfect opportunity to revisit them and to say, actually, let's make this clear, crystal clear how these operate. So um, so thank you very much, um, Sophie, for joining the discussion today. Thank you for everyone for, for joining our webinar. We hope you find it useful. Um, if you do want any help in, in any sort of uh, review of your articles um, to try and make them um, work alongside the implications of this. If this judgment, please, please get in touch. But uh, for now, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.